focus on the Wi-Fi. Right, hello everyone and welcome to our weekly Ask Kate live Facebook Q&A. Right, you'll see that I've got a special guest with me this week. Hi everyone. This is Isabel and she's the founder of Isabella Queen Handbags. Um, we're here today in the factory in East London where Isabel makes all her bags and she's going to be telling us all about how she launched the brand the trouble she's had with manufacturing and the solutions that she's found and other ways that she's been marketing her fantastic handbag brand and we'll also be giving you a sneak peek into her new range which is amazing I want every single one of them so if you are watching in and if, you are, if you've joined us and you want to ask Isabella a question then please type it in the comments and um, fire away and we'll, I'll ask it um, to Isabel so Isabel firstly thank you for joining me today um, can you tell me, just um, before you launched uh, the Isabella Queen brand, what was your, what, what did you do before? You weren't a handbag designer, were no, you? No, I was not. I used to work corporate and I worked as a senior project manager in financial IT. So completely different. Completely different. So what gave you the idea to suddenly launch a handbag brand? Well, actually it's been brewing since I was a teenager. Um, I'd spend years and years looking for handbags that I liked that were feminine but also um, socially and responsibly made. And all the bags that I found, they were made in Britain at the time, but they were quite somber, darks, blacks, browns, and it just wasn't what I wanted. But every year I settled and mostly I would either buy something I didn't like that was made in the UK or I would buy something that wasn't made in the UK that I, I liked, but I never really um, found the solution to my problem. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties, ten years later, that um, my brother sent me an article that sent me on, on the journey. So I signed up on a few short courses at the London College of Fashion yeah. and then spent about three and a half years doing very detailed market research and design research and things like that. And then eventually that's how I ended up launching the brand. So that's an interesting point, actually. So for everyone that might be watching that's thinking of developing a brand, mm -hmm. from the original idea to when you actually properly launched, it was three and a half years. Yes, because I had to make sure it wasn't just about launching one collection. Yeah. So before I launched, I'd actually completely designed about six collections. Right, yeah, that's really good And advice. also yeah. I had studied almost 400 brands to know exactly where my brand would fit and where the price points would fit and how I would be marketing it. And why did you decide to make the brand in the UK? For several reasons. One, um, I grew up in Africa and so I was always very mindful of how easy it is to exploit people when they don't have any money. And so from a, a moral perspective, I felt obliged to make sure that I could always say that my bags were morally clean and ethical. Yeah. And also, it's just down the road, you know, nobody has time to be spending you know, loads of money and loads of time going halfway across the world or even to different countries. Um, so for me, the natural and logical choice was here. I never looked elsewhere. And how did you find the manufacturer you're working with now? And how did that come back? Because it's not the first manufacturer you work no, with, No, it, it is not. So tell us the whole uh, manufacturing journey. story. Yeah. So, you know, it's actually been really interesting. And one of the things I would always say to emerging designers is if your designs are quality, they really speak for themselves. And you tend to get a lot of open um, recommendations and people would then speak of you, and word of mouth does a lot in this industry. So from the beginning, when I did my designs, people then introduced me to other people who introduced me to other people, and that's how I found everything. So eventually I found uh, my first factory, and they were a smaller outfit than this one, and then, you know, it was great, but because they were limited in their capacity, it was more expensive. And then actually, um, I reached out to Kate, <laughs> and, uh, and I said to her, you know, it's getting more and more expensive, and I, I want to be able to, you know, grow my business, and to do that, I need to, you know, take care of the costs, but still keep the manufacturing in the UK, and if London, in, in London if possible, because I live here, so can you recommend someone? And so she said, yes, <laughs> actually, they're coming to I mean, the manufacturer, um, and so I, I sent out an email, and I arranged with them, and uh, we met, and they took one look at my collections, and they were really awestruck and they said the quality is amazing um we love them we love the designs and i showed them the designs for what is now the new collection you're going to see in a little minute and then uh, they said yes we'll take you on board and that was a huge compliment for me because not having come from a background of fashion it's really great to have people in the industry saying you know what the quality really stands out in comparison to other people's and how um how do you communicate your designs to the manufacturer having not come from a sort of design background so what's the whole development process i tried to learn how to use adobe illustrator and right, one of the things in that. life that i have learned is that you have to acknowledge your weaknesses outsource and pay for them um, so i draw um 
freehand mm -hmm. with a pen, a, a pen, a fine pen and pencil. And actually, I draw them really detailed. I could, in theory, hand them over to the manufacturer because they've seen them and they said, I don't technically need to then pay somebody to transfer it into technical specs. But I do right, because yeah. that's what is the most beneficial for them. And also it ends up on A4 and I tend to draw for each bag on A2 all the different facets and that's a huge page to deal with. So after I've done that, they then go to somebody who works for me yeah. and then that person then transcribes it all basically into an A4 sheet yeah. and it's a certain format. So like a, a tech pack Exactly, thing, a tech pack yeah. for the manufacturer and then that comes here. And obviously that's not really the end of it either because when you do the tech pack and you do the design and you draw it, you think some things will work on some dimensions but it's not always the case. And during the manufacturing process there's tweaking, we have to take a centimetre off there and increase this and decrease that and sh shift the proportions ever so slightly. And then you get the amendments of the tech pack. So do you think now's a good time to unveil some of these bags? That you've, sure. we're, 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 I'm actually really honoured here because I've come here today to the factory at Seifel Brothers in uh, East London and they've just finished the samples for Isabel's new collection. So I saw them for the first time at the same time as she saw them for the yeah. first time today and I have to say they are amazing. My particular favourite is this one now unfortunately the lighting's a bit glary in here but can you see the back of it i'm not sure whether you everyone oh, can you see check effect. the colors out on that i mean i have to say and i was a bag a handbag buyer and designer in a previous life i did it for 15 20 years the quality on these bags is amazing mm. i mean they've got little hidden mag dots can you see that they're just snapshots and a little detail here for holding I mean, the quality is fantastic. And I have to say, I don't, we've also just chatted to another chap in the factory um, who, who I can't name, but he's getting his bags made here as well. He's actually come from New York and originally developed his collection in America mm. and has now come to London to get it made and said the quality is second to none, which is always fantastic to hear. So that, that bag's amazing as well. Do you, you want to um, tell everyone yeah. about? So um, with this new collection, we're doing something interesting because the first time that I'm actually wandering into the smaller leather goods um, arena and so we have our usual the large the big the medium clutch bag but we've all got we've got a wallet we have a wristlet and we have a little um passport holder um that also and you'll see our signature lining in there and it also holds a few cards so you can see the card slots in there um and there you go you've got the london tag that tells you where it's made and then you've got the brand tag here at the front Beautiful. I mean, this one, I mean, small leather goods is actually one of the most difficult things, I think, to get made here because there's so much detail in them. They're so labour intensive. Mm -hmm. They're obviously not going to be the cheapest products to buy, Isabel. Mm -hmm. I know you said to me earlier, how, who are your main customers and have you had any resistance to the price of these because they are made in London? Actually, no. Um, and I was just showing with Kate earlier on, nobody ever queries me on the price of the goods. Um, one, because of the quality, you see it. Um, it's really outstanding. Oops, sorry, I've got a battery issue. Hang on a minute. There we go. Um, yeah, because the quality is really outstanding, and so everybody can see that it's real leather, there's bits of gold in it, and so on and so forth. So, no, we never get a query on the price, but the inquiries are always from the same region. So, our biggest client by far is Asia. Yeah, and they surprising. have a lot of up and coming money and they actually, obviously the majority of leather goods are made in their backyard and they don't want those anymore. So now they're looking for things that are more exclusive and so that's where the majority of our um, of our market comes from and that means that from our very first season we exported that's our first brilliant. order that's with brilliant. an export order. And I have to say, anyone else that's watching this who is a British brand who isn't exporting, and I think I've said this on previous Facebook Lives we've done and when we've interviewed other Make It British members, Export is where British brands are really growing. Mm. So get out there with the Americans, the Asian market. They all love British made goods. Um, and I think they'll particularly um, love these as well. They're amazing. So um, you obviously, the, how long has the business been going now? Is it a couple of years? Mm -hmm. And you've already won quite a few awards. You've had a lot of press. Mm -hmm. What's been your secret to that? So um, I get asked this question a lot by emerging designers. I think two things. Um, and I keep going back to the quality of the product. If you can talk, you can network like crazy. But if you then bring the product and it doesn't match up to the hype, then immediately the whole thing falls flat. That's so true. So yeah. you need to make sure that even if you are not there and that somebody looks at the bag 
or looks at whatever it is, wallet, wristlet, that they will, the bag will speak for you and for your de design capability. And that's got to do with the quality of the design and also the quality of the manufacturer. So get those two things right. And then network, you know, go to places, meet people. Um, I've found it really easy, you know, being nice to people, it's free. It doesn't yeah. cost you anything. You know, I live in London, there's a lot of fashion events and so on. Um, and also join a forum like Make It British because actually the majority of my referrals have come from people who've gone onto the Make It British website. Have they? Yes. Oh, that's a I've never actually no, told no, you that. No, you haven't. No. Oh, brilliant. And, I'm, and, I'm blushing now. And they scroll through. <laughs> and, you know, even people who try and get, you know, the brands advertising, you know, all these magazines, oh, you know, we're having a British blah, 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 so on and so forth. And we find your details on the Make It yeah, British we website. we do get quite a lot of journalists crawling yeah. outside. Yeah. Like, and, yeah, and so, the, you know, the majority of the inquiries have come from that and also from the DIT yeah. kind of buyer service. So join that and I think, you know, network, go out there, meet people, show your product and it'll go from there because there's so few people right now doing quality yeah. made in the UK you know, and also just really, I can't drum this enough, really make sure the quality is top notch. Which yours definitely are. So if anyone's listening in, we can see we've got some comments here from uh, CFO saying, wow, very nice. Fine, McCarthy saying, lovely. If anyone has a question for Isabel, then please do type it in the comments now. Um, now's your chance. But she is also going to be speaking at our Make It British Forum, which is an event we're running on the 2nd of November in Manchester at the Manchester Business School. If you are a business setting up a British brand or you've got a brand made here, you want to find out more about what the pitfalls are, how people like Isabel have made it work very successfully. I mean, you only have to see that in two years she's already picked up all these accounts overseas. Find out more about how she's done it and how to develop a Made in Britain brand, then do come to our forum. You can find details out at the makeitbritishforum.com and we do have some tickets left but they sold out very early on last year so if you want to come don't miss out book a ticket right do we have any questions we've got quite a lot of viewers well if you did if you just come in a tail end of this and you've missed it oh we have got a question ellie hi guys what do you know now that you wish you had known when you first started out oh that's a good one this is a very controversial thing to say live on facebook but <laughs> i now know I wish I hadn't spent over a hundred thousand pounds on trade fairs. I wish I had just come straight to meet the manufacturer because <laughs> I spent. I didn't pay to say no, that. she did not. This is completely organic. I spent the least I have ever spent. I mean, magnitudes less than the others, and got the most return. And what I would say to make it made in Britain brand is this: you cannot actually in my opinion other people may disagree you cannot go to x y and z city and pitch your product at x y and z fashion week with other people who are manufacturing at x y and z at a much lower price point because the buyers going to there are looking for a bargain yeah. they are not looking for made in britain if you want a place where people are coming to look specifically for what you're making which the added benefit of coming of them coming to places like Meet the Manufacturer is that they know what they're looking for. Nobody steps into Meet the Manufacturer thinking, oh, I want something made in, you know. So, yeah, exactly. So they all know they're coming there and, and they have a much more focused buying point of view. And, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to the next one. I was the first to, to, to rebook. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now I know why. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that it's only going to grow. And, I, you know, and I look forward to more and more people coming. Thank you, Isabel. Coming, coming You've got some it. more questions. Yeah. Someone said, how do, you f how do you find sourcing the hardware? That's a very good point. They're finding it very difficult. Now, do you get your hardware made in the UK? Because I know there's so few places here. Not all of it, no. Yeah. Um, so um, I tried. Um, and it is very, very difficult. So in the end, I ask other people and, you know, word of mouth, when you see good quality, you ask, you know, and so I always naturally will refer other people to it. But then some of my hardware has come from here um, because, again, word of mouth. So I know that there's often questions on the Make It British Facebook page mm -hmm. um, where people are always asking, how, you know, where can I get this, where can I get that? And a lot of you out there are actually um, hardware suppliers on the group. So it's good for you to speak out and say, OK, yeah, we supply this and we supply like that so um, I think word of mouth is definitely also asking your manufacturer mm -hmm. um, I had an issue with this current sample um, with the, the zip and the zip would have been fine for the lining of the bags but for the first time we tried to um, where is it 
sorry, close up of my face. Uh, mm -hmm. We made a, a wristlet and um, there, the, the zip, there was an issue with the zip being on the outside. And so when I spoke with um, the, the guy who was... The, We're when running I, out of battery. I'm, you carry on talking. I'm yeah. going to go and plug in my battery charger because Isabel is offering some priceless information here. And I know she's going to want to talk longer than the 10% of my battery is going to last. So carry on talking, Isabel, about sourcing trims. And I'm going to plug in my yeah. charger. So then I, I spoke to them and I said to them, OK, how can we, you know, uh, fix this problem? And immediately the guy said to me, actually, if you go over um, to this place, which is only a 10 minute walk down the road, they'll, you know, and ask him for this, this and this specifically. And so so he actually built up the zip um, and then when I put the sample and I unzipped it and I thought fantastic um, and you know he'd unpicked the whole thing and, and redid it all actually after it had already been finished with the original zipper which wasn't really the best uh, quality so work with your manufacturer and really listen to what they've got to say. Well I have to say that actually there are a shortage because because the UK um, wasn't producing anything for quite a long time there was quite a shortage of the, the extras supplies, like the buttons, the zips, I and mean, mm. the trims. It's one of the questions I get asked all the time. And I'd love to be able to say, yes, you can get all your handbag fittings and your zips and everything in, made in the UK. But currently, you can't get everything made mm. here. Um, mm. you know, there are people like Abby who provide brass trims, the Zipex who do zip, but they don't do handbag zips. And mm. I don't know of anyone at the moment. But I am gradually seeing more and more people open up. There's a brand new button factory opening up recently. So it is happening, but you can't always find them here. We've got more questions. Zach Taylor, he runs a canine apparel brand wow. and resells existing brands. Whilst we sell different things, what are the realistic startup costs for designing, <laughs> sourcing, and creating your products? That is a really good question. Okay, so I'm just going to be it, honest. I'm How much did it, it cost there? you to launch this? Considering that in the three and a half years I was doing R and D, that was also cost intensive because you're buying products you're paying for molds to be opened for you know branded zipper pulls and tags and so on and so forth in the last five years I have spent about a hundred and fifty thousand pounds starting the business now everyone just falls over yes. and actually I don't think that I mean I I've heard I, it could I, have been a lot more yes it could have been I do ha you know the gone are the days of people with 500 pounds like the Cambridge Satchel company mm -hmm. being able to launch mm -hmm. a multi-million pound brand mm -hmm. it is an expensive business launching a brand and also you want to be taken seriously yeah there's also the legal side invest. of it as well because you can't just you know start anything now you know have to protect yourself legally you have to do trademarking you have to get lawyers you have to get accountants you have to you know there's only so much you can do yourself and if you're really serious about growing a global brand you know everyone starts small but we're all doing this you know to kind of take over the world at least I am <laughs> and also leather bags are quite an expensive product yeah, yeah. to develop to, yeah and, and the sort of quality that you've got here I mean I know people that have set up garment labels who've maybe done it for around 10,000 yeah. um, or if you it depends if it's a huge collection depends how many samples you get made if you're a designer and you know what it is you want to do and you've got a clear idea you won't waste money developing loads of samples that at the end of the day mm -hmm. you can't sell so it is all about being organized and also making sure you start with a sample like a, a small collection you mm. know capsule collection Zach said how much were the molds well it's not technically molds is it for handbags but I suppose for, for, for a the sample for no I think he's sample. talking about the hardware oh talking about the hardware yeah so usually the going price is anything from two to two hundred fifty dollars slash pounds yeah. per thing so um in my very first collection i think i had six yeah because you've got isabella queen I've you've got, got the london, london tag yeah i actually designed the chain myself and i had it manufactured which is crazy oh really yeah. so it's your own bespoke yeah, chain so it's my own bespoke yeah. chain yeah. and then you know there's lot there's lots of hidden costs and i think you know if you want to start or you know if you want to, to know more please feel free to reach out to me I'd be totally happy to give you some more insight yes and we'll give Isabel's details at the end I can see we've got some more questions and they're disappearing off my screen we've got so many CM Covey duck how do you find sourcing your oh, hardware no, we've, we've that covered one. that one <laughs> Mita hi Isabel hey. how did you go about finding a factory in the UK to develop these price these products at a price for your price point for your brand I didn't start at the price point I started at made in the UK and then I went to the factory and then that determined my price point so um, you can't turn up and say you know make me this I want to sell it for a hundred pounds it doesn't yeah. work that way so you know you have to work from the top down um, and then at the end then say okay this may be a, a, more than I was expecting 
to have a realistic expectation and say it was more than I was expecting. What can we do? And there are secrets. So, and I'll share some of you with them now quickly. For the Union Jack, originally I wanted um, the leather actually folded and stitched and that's more labor intensive. So in the end, they just cut it and then did an edge coating. So there are things that other people wouldn't notice are still the same quality. Um, but that actually bring the cost of production down. So you can talk with your manufacturer and they, they know what they're doing. Yeah, so they'll tell you. they would be able to yeah. advise you on that sort of thing. So don't be um, rigid. too rigid about mm -hmm. what price you're expecting from a manufacturer, but work with them. Because if you storm in there saying, I want this made for £20, then, I mean, I, I, actually, as the factory was, was just saying to me just now before we came on live, um, they're so busy now that actually they interview designers before they take them on. Mm -hmm. So it's not the other way around a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. You need to, to pitch yourself to a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. What else? Damon says, hello, Isabel. Do you have a favourite leather? Yes, I do. Good question. I do. And I love it just because of the feel. And it's Italian veal. I just, I love it. Vegans don't listen. <laughs> I apologise to all vegans, um, but yeah, we, we use real leather here. Um, but I love I love the feel um, of Italian veal. It's I did I do also like Italian softy, but I like the Italian veal because the same soft feel but much firmer. So it means that over the time you get less wrinkling and so on and so forth. So that's my favourite leather. And no one tans that sort of leather here at the moment. No, unfortunately. Um, ah, Sifo, yeah, good question. How much are your bags and how can I order one? Well, um, <laughs> we can send you out a line sheet and order form afterwards. Can you? Yes, we can. Well, so if someone does want to find you, Isabel, yes. where can they find your lovely bags? What's so, your website? What's your social media? So our website is www.isabellaqueen.co.uk and uh, interesting fact, you can actually customise your own bag on our website. So you can oh, do nice. that, choose your colours, choose your linings and then in a couple of months get a bag that effectively is bespoke for you and can, oh, now you know i want this one i do know in you want my that orange one. white and blue colors <laughs> brilliant have we got any more questions excuse me a minute flicking through um oh meter we do vegan leather yeah i can say a vegan leather is actually polyurethane which comes with its own environmental problems because of the uh, landfill however meter where where can Isabel um, buy your vegan leather if she does have any vegan customers wanting her bags made in a vegan version? Put something in the comments and let us know. Damon says thank you. Um, ah, Zach's asked another question. Did you just draw, design your handbag and go to a manufacturer for advice and sampling? And we did answer that early on, Zach. I'm not sure whether you missed that. Not entirely, because actually when I did the short course at the London College of Fashion, I not only did the handbag design, but I also did the making. So, oh, so you learned how to make a bag. Yes, yeah, I which did. Is useful. So I know how to work with them, and nothing that they say is, you know, Greek to me. So I think that that's really key. Obviously, and I'll never know as much as they do, but over the time, you, the knowledge is transferred, and I'm learning a lot about manufacturing as well. So, brilliant. Yeah. Have we got any more questions here? Meter, very difficult to find a manufacturer in the UK willing to work with vegan. That is also true, I have to say. Um, well, small order, order quantities, I would say possibly not. I mean, the place we're in today, they what, what sort of quantities will they make for you? So with the smaller leather goods, the wallets, the wrists and stuff, it's an MOQ of 50, but they're small. And yeah. then with the bigger bags, it's MOQ of 20. But within that, you, you know, you do get to pick and choose certain colors and colorways and things so it's not as rigid but I think what I would say is that it it does they have the upper hand because they're choosing you so it's part of their terms to you and you have to negotiate that and their approach to you very much depends on what their view of you as a designer is and of the quality of the, the product that you design um, another question from Sifa, that's interesting, um, says that they have an online business and would you be interested in resale? So they obviously want to know if you can wholesale your bags. Yes, so, so we, we do wholesale and we also do um, customers on the website. So we do both and we'd be happy to um, speak with you about retail. I'll put you in touch website. with Isabel. And, in fact, Isabel, how did you make sure that you had that margin in order to be able to wholesale these bags when you first developed them? Because obviously once by the time you sell them to another retailer, they're going to put their markup on. Yes. How did you manage to make manage to make that work? Well, I think that making in the UK actually allows you to. I think with other designers I've seen that have manufactured elsewhere, they've ended up going under 
in the first few years because it's hard to convince, especially when you're selling to customers on your website and selling wholesale, it's hard to convince, um, you know, the end consumer to pay for something. But when it's made here mm. and it carries a certain quality and there's all that leather as well, um, it's not really been a problem mm. for me. Um, yeah, and obviously with with the the B two B, we have kind of favourable terms, so that includes duties paid and shipping, and so we. Reconnect. Oh, no, we're yay. back on. Sorry that we dropped out, but it looks like we are. We're back and we haven't lost everyone. So Mita says, if you know of any vegan manufacturers, that would be great. That is a good point, Mita. Do you recommend any insurance? Do you re I think just access because your bags, uh, I don't know, that, what do you mean by the insurance? Is it because they're well, very insurance? Yeah, I well, don't yes. know, insurance for your product. Oh, you mean as a, do you mean as a personal consumer? Or do you, do you mean as a brand, should you have insurance for your product? Um, as a personal consumer, your um, high-end products should be covered by your home insurance, um, so you need to check that. <laughs> mine, mine are, um, and you know, usually they do like a handbag tag on with all the things in your handbag. Anyway, I don't really know anything about insurance, so please contact your insurance broker. Um, and <laughs> and um, with as a as a business, absolutely, you should um, you should have um, you should have insurance, such as third-party liability. I'm not quite sure what you mean about that, Zach. Third-party liability. You'll have to explain more. About I guess from sure. from a legal perspective, and I, you know, I can tell you from the contracts that we have, um, we have with our suppliers, there are legal terms that define the ownership of the bags at a certain point in the journey. So your the the legal ownership may pass at the border of departure or at the border of arrival see, or yeah. when it's signed for or when after it's signed for after seven days and then done the inspection there's loads of different legal definitions and you know as a brand you should definitely have legal representation and, and speak to your law firm about that and you know the way that the the, the contracts are structured but legally for my brand i can't speak for anyone else's but i know that we are responsible for the insurance until the point at which then ownership transfers um, to to <laughs> the the. Person. I think Zach's not necessarily talking about. Um, I, you've got a good point there. Though. You're talking about export. And yeah. what, at what point should they be insured? Anyone. Zach's talking about personal liability. I'm not sure I've heard of anyone that's done themselves a nasty with a handbag. <laughs> you club somebody over <laughs> the like head with it, but that's not really age, what you're supposed to do. do. You? Um, I guess I, I have no idea about that. No, no. We'll follow that up later. Um, allergic reaction. Yeah, that actually, that is a good point, Zach, because actually when I was a handbag buyer, we used to have to make sure that the metal hardware on a bag was nickel free. Yes. I'm pretty sure it's all nickel free these yes, days. Yes, it is all it? nickel free. And after that, all it, it has what's called electrophoretic varnishing on top that's really really thick um and that basically protects um you know even after years of rubbing from exposure to the skin secondary to that we all our products go out with a, a, a beautiful care card we also have a section on our website and it's very comprehensive explaining okay this is leather and this is you know yeah. the the, the metal and this is how you need to work with the both of them in order to maximize the lifetime of your handbag actually zach it's all becoming clear now you said you'd be surprised what you hear with dog coats Right, I see. So you're saying people, you obviously got a dog coat business and people are taking you to court for various issues, but I can imagine people are so precious about their dogs. Um, I would have thought, does your own public liability as a business not cover you for that? Yes, it should do, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm, interesting ones. And Hayley, I spotted a message from someone called Hayley here. Excuse me, going back. Um, Hayley said, how much do your bags retail at? So what's the starting price? Um, so, bags. so basically now with the smaller leather goods, we're looking at anything from 200 to 2000. So it depends on which one. Yeah. And Ellie has said, how long did it take you from initial conception of the idea to launching? Three and a half years. I actually delayed it for six months. Originally I had timetabled a three year R&D period. Um, but halfway through the second year, I realized that I was not going to be done in time. I didn't feel like I knew enough. And once you get launching, especially because I do seasons, you can't stop. There's nothing worse yeah. than saying, okay, exhibit three seasons and then whoop, 
nothing for the fourth one so the, the momentum is going and you have a calendar and you have to stick to all those dates and it's a real you know operation so you have to be sure that once you start that's it it's like push starting a car down a hill you can't <laughs> yeah. stop yeah. so I had to be ready so um originally I was actually planning to launch with um, an autumn winter collection and in the end I then you know flipped it and started with yeah. the with the spring summer and actually that's a really good question because a lot of people contact me and they say I want to launch a brand handbag garments dog coats whatever and I'm and they contact me in June and say I'm hoping to launch it before Christmas and it's unlikely to happen you need to be realistic I mean I think three and a half years is quite a long time but you've come from quite a different background and you obviously did extensive research and once you've got launched you've really hit the ground running um, I would say at least allow at least 18 months if you're if you're launching a brand at the very very the very least yeah. right have we got any more questions Hayley, where did you find the right market for your bags? I presume you knew that from your research when you started. I did, I did know that from my research and um, over the, the time, and one of the good things about giving it time and speaking to people and networking was that very quickly I accumulated a very um, amazing um, non-exec board of directors. Um, yes. How did uh, you find them? They came to me. Oh, really? So I was introduced yeah. to people via word of mouth and once they saw the designs and they saw a 105 page business plan and they saw how meticulous I was mm. they said okay I want to be part of the journey how, what can I do to help you and it was actually incredible so you know one of them who works for um, or used to work for two decades for probably British Britain's most well-known uh, luxury accessories brand mm. um, she said to me and uh, she was their general manager for two decades. She mm. said to me, your first order will be an export. And God, how she was right. Really? So she, so she said to me, you know, for the first so amount of years, they didn't have a market in Britain. And Britain only came on board when they were being left behind. Oh, so, um, Can you yeah. just explain to me, for anyone listening as well, if what is the non-exec director's role? If someone has got a brand and they think, right, I want to take it to the next level. I think I need some sort of non-exec director how does that relationship work effectively you know it's it's pro bono you don't pay them and it's people who really like what you're about you know they they're giving back they're mentoring you but also they publicly mentor you so you use their name as you know leverage to say okay this person is on board and they're in non-executive advisory capacity you know you have meetings with them it can be as informal as a glass of champagne somewhere or more of a sit down structured thing or you can send them so you know you work with them um, and you don't have to have them all together at the same time um, so for me I run all those meetings separately and I strategically in, in as much as they came to me I strategically picked them for different reasons because they're coming one was an expert in Asia a right, real expert yeah. um, spoke Mandar uh, Mandarin Cantonese um, um, and uh, Korean fluently wow. and the other person was from this company I just mentioned and you know a couple of them were one was the founder of an incubator a fashion incubator so it, it allowed me to have different aspects and you know, you, I, I came from a background where I've been running multi-million pound portfolios in a corporate world. I wasn't afraid of the business side, but I was not from a fashion background. So I needed those people and you need to really place those people around you so that you can maximize your chances of success. Yeah, I agree. Good advice. Um, Sachs also asked, and he said he knows it's different for every industry, but what sort of markup you put onto your products? So at wholesale, I sell them 40% of the retail price, the recommended retail price. And um, within that, they get perks. So, and usually people say it's like between 33 and 35, mm. but I sell it 40 and I include duty paid and free global shipping. Right. And that comes with all the sundries. Yeah. So okay. they get quite a good package. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And Jane has said, um, are you a sustainable business? I hear so much of this now. And as I'm just about to launch a business, I'm really keen to tap into this as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So discuss sustainability. Sustainab sustainability is one of these new buzzwords. And I think that, you know, anybody can throw it around. It's a bit like designed mm -hmm. in, you know, you have to just make sure that your entire business is really ethical to your particular um, priorities. So I would describe Isabella Queen as a sustainable business because we're really careful with 
our um, production line, our use of product. We reuse as much as possible, um, and we, you know, we, we use the same leather from the same supplier, and you know, we are really careful with our shipping, uh, and we try to do everything to minimise our carbon footprint. And we have a section on our website that talks about that. So if you're interested, you can check it out. It's um, isabellaqueen.co.uk, and just follow the links there. Yeah, I think one thing that's a very good point is sustainability is almost how long it's a piece of string. Yeah. It is the trendy buzzword at the moment. I think just by making in the UK, you're being significantly more s sustainable than if you were shipping bags in from the Far East, for instance, creating a big carbon footprint. I mean, we're here today in the factory. You can see the people. I've met the people that are making Isabel's bags. I can see the environment they're working in. And they're all happy, smiley people. And you can tell that it's a the great place. And actually, we're going to be doing an article um, on the Make a British website very soon about how to find and spot an ethical factory, how to know the good from the bad mm -hmm. and the ugly. We've got more questions. Yeah, can you trace up the all your materials? Yes, I yes. can. Um, oh. Yeah, so I can trace every single one of my materials and I know the factories where everything is made. I, I know how they dispose of waste material um, and I know what their health and safety um, um, policies are. I have visited every single one of them. So I'm very aware of the environment in which all the little widgets that come together to make an Isabella Queen bag yeah. come from. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Jane says, thank you, Zach. has got loads of fantastic questions, it Zach. Does, he yeah. says, do you just rely on an online presence? Do you have times with Google AdWords, for example? Tried that. Um, like burning £20 notes. Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off it goes into the air like it didn't. How do you drive traffic it. to your website? So I think, you know, when it comes to a brand that's made in the UK, you know, I was told, and this is another piece of advice that came from one of my non-exec directors, is that, you know, for the first five years, forget about making any profit. You need to build a brand. People don't buy a bag, they buy a brand. And so for the first five years, everything you do is a giant marketing exercise. Some work, you repeat, some don't work, you don't repeat. So over the time, for example, Google AdWords for me has been one that doesn't work, so I haven't repeated it. But the majority of the online presence has actually come from referrals from other places. Again, the Make It British website is a huge... Um, Yes, oh, we're back. Yeah. Sorry, we keep dropping out. We're in a basement. We are in a basement. Yeah. Oh, what um, a bright basement. You were talking about how you refer traffic to your website. Actually, I have to say here, you are very good on Instagram. And and I think well, I hear from a lot of our Make It British members that Instagram is currently their biggest driver for customers because it's very visual. So if you've got a product, it's a great way of showing off, showing off your personality. Mm -hmm. I mean, Isabel, you've got your own... Yes, your I own have my own Instagram, Instagram and your business one yeah. and you're very personal on it and people can really see behind the brand and you know it's funny because I'm a real introvert I don't I'm private and I'm an introvert and again one of my non-exec directors said to me you know what the brand is great but people want to know you so you need yeah, a personal Instagram so and I fought the idea for a year and then eventually I signed up and she said to me, and not just a personal Instagram, you need to be personal on your personal there's Instagram. pictures of your mum on there? Oh yeah, there's pictures of my mum, my your cats, to be. my fiancé, yeah. you know, I talk about a lot of things, you know. And people can, re you know, get to know me and that helps them buy into the brand because that, you know, it's not just about, oh, so-and-so name of so-and-so brand. They really want to know the journey of the person who began it. Yeah. So that's really important. But back to the whole website thing, I, I think, you know, getting talked about by as many different sources as possible is a really good way. Yeah, brilliant. I hope we didn't miss anything there when we cut off. I think Zach said he cut off. I don't think you missed anything, Zach, because yeah, yeah. well, we didn't. We were just talking amongst ourselves when we cut out. Yeah. Jane's got a really good point. Do you write your own blog, or how do you feel about other people being your voice? I don't. I'm exhausted, so I don't have the time currently to write my own blog. So I do it a lot through Instagram, and I write quite long Instagram posts. And that's how, for me right now, the blog is working. Um, and I also, I think it's just more accessible. Like the last time I sat down, clicked and read a whole, you know, on, on Tumblr. Does that mean you're not reading the Make a British blog? I do. <laughs> I do. I, well, like, the thing is, that comes through an email and it's easy to click, right? So that's another thing that's accessible. But, yeah. you know, I, I think for me right now, you know, working through my personal Instagram is the way that I kind of blog my journey. Yeah. Yeah. I'd actually like to make a point there about being your voice. I would say, I mean, the Make It British website I wrote, it's been going now for 
seven, eight years, and I wrote it all myself for the first six. Wow. I've now got someone who does help me out, but I have the final edit on it. I found my voice first before I then let anyone oh, take over any of it. And they could then see all my back catalogue, see what my tone of voice is, and they could help me out with the content. Because I got a point where we couldn't create, I couldn't keep creating content when I'm running events, interviewing people like Isabel, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. But you do need to find your own voice first. I've seen so many brands who send out a press release where it's obviously written by someone who doesn't know the product mm -hmm. and it's not passionate enough and enough about them. So I think what Isabel is the saying there is if you haven't got time to blog, do it through your Instagram and be a person and show behind the brand on there. And everyone wants to see the stories behind British made brands, which is part of the reason we're doing these interviews now. So we can let you see behind the brand. Now, I think that's quite, that's been our longest Facebook Live ever. I think we need to let poor Isabel go because she's got lots of important uh, things to do. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to get this um, typed up as an interview as well for the Make It British website. So we will post the article and all of the uh, all of the interview at a later date so keep an eye out subscribe to our newsletter because we always put it all in there as Isabel just said we send that out weekly every Tuesday and it keeps you up to date with everything we've been doing thank you everyone for joining us thank you very much Isabel you were amazing thank you very uh, much really really good if you've got more questions for Isabel then do come along to our Make It British Forum because she's going to be the best guest she's going to be amazing because she knows everything you need to know about developing a made in britain and don't forget brand. to follow us on our different social medias it's yeah. just at isabella queen and you'll find us instagram pinterest twitter linkedin facebook brilliant and i'm now going to disappear with this <laughs> <laughs> Bye. bye